Good morning, everybody. Nice to see you here. And um, I just wanted to make a little note about the title of this presentation. My presentation, it was a little funny on the poster, if you noticed. It was the first initial proposal that I discussed with you that's on the poster, and it's kind oh, of yeah. a stream of consciousness kind of <laughs> thing. But maybe it's somehow it's okay. It's not a problem because it's it's correctly on the website, and so not a big deal. But I just wanted to mention that in case some of you wondered what is she about, what is, what's her state of mind? <laughs> is she is she okay? <laughs> so, <laughs> so so it's a little bit probably more clear clear today. This this um, title of my talk. But anyways, when I started to work on this presentation I, and, and thinking, think, think about the notion of creativity, I was, I was really stuck at first. I had this hunch that, um, and this vague feeling that something about it bothers me or something about the way it's being used nowadays, especially in educational policy and discourse. This is a concept that I have been deeply engaged during my early stages of my, my academic career, creativity. Uh, but I had left it all but untouched for, for many years. Um, so one of my aims has been, when I have been preparing this talk, to make sense of what, what is this hunch, this uncomfortable, uneasy feeling when I read educational policy and, and take part in some educational discourse that uh, discusses this notion of creativity. Okay, while being stuck, I started to put together this power pre PowerPoint presentation, hoping that it would uh, get me going somehow. And to make the process smoother, I first chose a template that I had created earlier for another presentation. However, this, uh, that template seemed somehow inert to me. It didn't trigger any, any inspiration. I then decided to make a new template and remembered this photo, this photo, uh, that I had taken from an airplane window. And then I remember that I had written something on, on a, something that I was reading when I saw this from the window. I, I, had, I was reading something and I said, took, took my pen and started to just dot down some words when I was looking outside or after. <laughs> so uh, then I, I looked, I found a piece of paper, this uh, document that I had just dotted something and I I read it. So this is what I had written. The moment when the sun gleamed from the between the clouds and disappeared again. There's an empty space between two carpets of clouds, flat and wide. In between, nothing as of yet. I then realized that what happened then, when I was watching and writing, and well, then, just now, or when I was starting to work on this presentation and needed this new photo and new, new, something new to trigger my thinking, it was about the same phenomenon that I wanted to address in my presentation. This brief moment that I was almost too late in capturing, so let's see, the sun has already disappeared because it takes a minute or even seconds, just seconds to take the camera out and all that. So um, I missed the sun, actually, it's somewhere. <laughs> I was almost too late in capturing with my camera. I was, it, this was an intense aesthetic experience that remained with me for a long time. I believe we, have, we all have memories of moments when something out of the ordinary, out of our everyday life, has made us dwell in this experience in awe. Something inside us has perhaps shifted. Everyday life has become still for a moment, 
and we have become drawn into sphere of aesthetic experience. We continue on with our daily lives, perhaps somewhat sensitized and touched. After having experienced such a moment, I often think, what would my life be like without these moments? What would the, what would the world be like without the possibility to be surprised by beauty, to shift from everyday experience to wonder and amazement? Often I wonder also how easy it is to bypass these possibilities, to experience something special, something that does not produce immediate measurable benefit. I am worried about the decreasing significance of aesthetic experience and the increasing search for measurable outcomes, economical profits, innovations, creating new products for us all to consume. I am especially concerned about the divide between indiv individuals whose need for aesthetic experience is being nurtured and those who, whose needs are being neglected for a reason or another. It is right here where I think that the notion of creativity is being misused, misunderstood and where educational policies are being led astray. This divide leads to a situation where the renewal of culture lies in the hands of the chosen, chosen few, often those who have displayed some form of creative talent. It is too easy for the rest to remain passive, consuming instead of creating. Creative individuals, on the other hand, are being harnessed for the purposes of creative industries and turned into innovators. I will return turn to these critical thoughts shortly. Before doing so, I will present some theoretical and philosophical views to substantiate my argument regarding aesthetic pre-reflective experiences and bodily sensations as premises for creativity. According to the ecological art theory presented by Paul Crowther, a mental image precedes thinking and language. Aesthetic or sensory experiences are an integral part of what it is to be a human being. And imagination enables creative interpretation of reality. A cre creative dialogue, like this for instance, I'm not saying this is a great piece of poetry, it's just very raw, uh, between reality and imagination is free. Yet, this dialogue is situated in the concrete, observed reality, and as such, it is a conscious activity. As Crowther puts it, our inherence in the aesthetic domain is part of our full definition as human beings. Crowther's thoughts resonate strongly with my experiences related to artistic work or any creative activity. I have articulated my experiences as follows. In artistic work, one can enter into a quiet dialogue with oneself. One becomes conscious of something new. An image, figure, idea or thought emerges in one's mind and inspires and drives one forward. The resulting form gives impulses and ideas for elaboration. The, this the connection to a pre-linguistic world of experience guides us our choices without words. Artistic activity gives an external form to our experiences and thus opens, the opens up the possibility of exchanging and communicating meanings that are often difficult to convey otherwise. Art is a way of analyzing and interpreting human experiences and the human rela human's relationship with the world. Similar internal dialogues can arise when a human being meets an artwork or interprets a work created by another human being. The encounter is special, at the same time complete and yet free. The key word here is emergence. Images, ideas and thoughts emerge for us. They are presented to us by the world. This view displaces the human agents from their dominant position as creators or knowers. This perspective to creative act
facts and th uh, thoughts is captured in the following quote by the French philosopher Gilles Deleuze. Something in the world forces us to think. This something is an object not of recognition, but of fundamental encounter. It may be grasped in a range of affective tones, wonder, love, hatred, suffering, in whichever tone its primary characteristic is that it can only be sensed. Another quote from non-representational theorists Ben Anderson and Paul Harrison crystallizes this relational ontology where everything is connected. Thought is placed in action and action is placed in the world. These views support the deconstruction of essentialist modernist views on creativity as an individual subjective capacity and towards seeing creativity as emergent, reciprocal and relational process. It takes place in between, in connection to the physical, material world and within shared social spaces. Such emergent expressive acts are not necessarily just individual self-expressions connected to a human es essence. Thus, they are not tied to the modernist notions of subject or self. Not only creative processes, but all learning, I think, uh, is relational. It takes place not only in the individual's brain, but with, within the entire body, between other human and non-human bodies and in connection to the physical reality. As James Williams notes, to learn is to learn how to be sensitive and to respond creatively to signs and problems as things that necessarily go beyond what is known or what can be done in a given situation. This sensitivity and creativity are linked Learning is above all experimentation, free of goals in knowledge or skills. Post-structuralist new materialist philosophers are not alone in addressing relationality. Ellen Dissanayake, an independent interdisciplinary scholar and the author of several books, for, for example, um, homo aestheticus and art and intimacy, argues that the aesthetic principles and forms of non-linguistic interaction unite people and build communities. Critically working within interdisciplinary fields like neuroaesthetics and aesthetic cognition, she has developed the so-called artification hypothesis. She claims that the role of non-linguistic interac interaction based on aesthetic principles, has been of equal importance in the development of the human species as the role of linguistic com communication. She, she also claims that pre-verbal, affective and aesthetic mechanisms continue to influence human language and cognition. The non-linguistic area of human experience also uh, uh, caught the interest of neuroscientists. According to Antonio Damasio, for example, the images produced by different sensory channels make up the history of ourselves and our lives. They reflect the interaction between the human being and the world and are as much creations of the brain as they are products of external reality. In this way, neuroscientific thinking approaches the art philosophical concept of creative interpretive interaction between human being and the world in which sensory observation, aesthetic experience and imagination intertwine. The processes that generate this intertwinement are mostly beyond our own control and awareness. James Catterall speaks of silence and refers to it as a process of the nervous, nervous system that we are not aware of. Silence, which the linguist George Lakoff and philosopher Mark Johnson refer as the cognitive unconscious, is an area below modes of awareness, both reflective and pre-reflective. So below both of these levels. 
However, silence or unthought, to use a term introduced by Anne Catherine Hales, interacts, intertwines with and influences the contents of our consciousness, what we can sense, perceive, imagine, think, and create. Imagination in, indeed can, and in my view, should be not seen as making up novel ideas, but rather something that happens to us, emerges, if and when we open our senses. In his book Force of Imagination, the sense of element, the elemental, John Salis turns to the sensible and to the ele elemental in nature. He intends to liberate imagination from subjectivity and shows how imagination draws together the moments of our experience of sensible things. According to Salis, there's nothing more forceful than the force of imagination, for this force is such that it can bring together what cannot be brought together. On the other hand, he says, there is nothing less forceful than imagination because it does not turn against the force that separates them. It only lets things show themselves as they properly are. An aesthetic experience arises from reality but at the same time, an illusion or transformation of that reality is an indis indispensable condition for an aesthetic creative response. In his doctoral dissertation on the Finnish educational philosopher Juho Hollos, Educational Thinking, Matti Taneli argues that education is a creative process in which human beings, through their own activity, develop both themselves and the environment. This kind of education also includes the idea of surpassing the limits of concrete reality that exists now. Here the key power is imagination, which connects to emotions and results in intellectual synthesis and formation of new combinations. In this view, education is understood as an attempt to transcend reality, to be in constant motion, going towards something that cannot and should not be predefined. In connection to the notion of embodied learning that I have developed and studied for past 10 years, I have described this relationship between external world and experien experiential bodily knowledge as a dialogue of between non-symbolic and symbolic information in which sensations are born in organic processes but through observation, interpretation, reflection and expression are transformed into symbolic representations in language, numbers, diagrams, images, music and dance. In embodied learning, non-symbolic sensations generated by physical action and multisensory engagement become interconnected with symbolic knowing and lead towards complex meaning-making processes within the social and cultural world. These views represent the kind of thinking that delineates the, the premises for creativity for me. I will now turn to some views on creativity that I have recently encountered in educational discourse and policy and this is the effort to shed light on um, putting these, my view, these views that I just presented and these discourses uh, next to each other, I try to make, shed light on this, this hunch that I had when I started uh, this working on this presentation. Uh, my first critical point is related to the notion of education for innovation brought forward by the OECD recently. As we know, the next PISA study in 2021 will focus on creative thinking and it's, it's build, building on the framework uh, developed by the CERI project, Center for Educational Research and Innovation, I think it stands for. This project is outlined by a report by Lucas Claxton and Spencer entitled Progression in Student Creativity in School, First Steps Towards New Form of Formative Assessments. A 
according to the authors, there's um, growing consensus that formal education should cultivate the creativity and critical thinking skills of students to help them su succeed in modern globalized economies based on knowledge and innovation. However, teachers and countries' ability to foster and monitor progress is limited by a lack of understanding of how some of these skills materialize at different development stages. One reason why these competencies, competencies are not promoted in a systematic way, systematic way, this language is, as I, I kind of stop myself, I'm like a systematic way, is that education systems uh, have rarely established ways to assess them formally. Another related reason is that beyond an agreement on the broad objective, it is not clear how these skills can be visibly and tangibly articulated by teachers, students and policymakers, especially as part of the curriculum. With this project, the OECD Center for Education la, 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 aims to further develop and re refine an, our understanding how creative and critical thinking skills can be assessed in an educational setting. I'm not denying that this is not important. It's just there's this, this contrast that I'm trying to make sense of out of. Further, the authors, authors note that um, there is an increasing consensus about which dispositions might serve as indicators of the strength of creative, creative minded, minded, mindedness in individuals. They then refer to a comprehensive meta-analytical review of creativity, creativity literature, which compared 120 definitions of creativity in papers exploring the traits, characteristics, and other personal attributes distinguishing highly creative individuals from their peers. <laughs> so they then had this um, Treffinger at, uh, at uh, or I'll uh, had, had grouped this 120 disposition into these four categories, which uh, are generating ideas, digging deeper into ideas, openness and courage to explore ideas, and listening to one's inner voice. So while these traits are interesting, this, these four groups, I wonder, are they not something that all children are born with and that we should really see that this is the core of education in all and of course education for creativity so what is new in this in, in a way okay so uh, they continue by Lucas Claxton and Spencer continue by presenting other attempts to map the dispositions that underlie creative performance one attempt uh, lists 13 dispositions that I just have listed here, and I have um, bolded the ones that are really related to, to uh, sen sensory uh, senses and intuition and the body and such things. But I don't see the word aesthetic in this list or art, imagination. It's a, good, it's a really good list, I'm not saying that, but it's, it's still, after all this work, it's, it's neglecting this area that I, I'm, I'm talking about here. So, after this, uh, this uh, project, they, the authors have arrived at the definition of critical creativity as coming up with ideas and solutions and more specifically as the ability to feel, empathize, observe, describe relevant experience and information, explore, seek, and generate ideas, make connections, integrate other, and so on. I'm not reading all this, it's, but again, I'm not seeing the realm of the aesthetic in, in these lists. So that is what started to worry me. Now I realize that, that there is something missing. And the body is disappearing as well. The embodiment, the senses, the body, 
and, and aesthetics. The authors do discuss some conceptual difficulties in this work. They agree that creativity does not denote the giftedness, new to the world ideas or innovation in the sense of idea solutions with po proven social market value. They propose that creativity is usually about originality plus some level of usefulness and functionality, fun fluency plus originality plus elaboration, and divergent exploratory plus convergent integrative. And then they state that uh, in their case, creativity denotes to imagination, is coming back, ide idea ideation, exploring unusual uh, ideas, experimenting, and creating of something personally novel, and daring to be different, which I remember from your talk yesterday. Uh, So then, this all leads to this following rubric for assessing creativity, which I just leave you to look at for a minute. So it's condensed from all that work. Okay. And it has led, many of you have probably seen this, five, uh, the five creative dispositions model. This is leading to the PISA uh, 2021. This is the same model in a, oops, in a little bit easier to read since they are horizontal, the lines, so we see a little bit um, about what is what is being addressed in this this model. While this model is is there's nothing really wrong with this. It's just that it's not it's missing these elements that I I have been deeply engaged with ever since I started working in the field of education. So it's just that's why I have felt that what is going on, and of course, plus uh, adding this market value language and, and global economy language into education is, is another other worrying, other con concern of mine. Check the time. Oops, okay, I will speed up. Um, okay. I just quickly show how creativity and innovation is also tied together in the 21st century skill, skills discourse. And that it, it really uh, creates more rub rubrics and metrics. Creativity and innovation rubric for grades 6 to 12 of public schools. And they, that uh, picture is actually from that page. It's, I didn't add it, so it's, it's, it just tells another story. Okay, so instead of creativity as an ability to come, with, come up with ideas and so on, I am interested in the conditions for creativity and the soil where the seeds for new ideas may find a place to grow. This soil, in my view, is the pre-reflective, pre-linguistic realm of human consciousness. A fertile soil is rich and porous. When our, consciousness is, when our consciousness is receptive to various sensations and impressions that the world presents to us, the seeds can grow to new ideas and creative expressions. Eliot Eisner speaks about sense of nuances of, or connoisseurship. Connoisseurship is about understanding the significance of qualities and details, as well as about attentive observation and delaying conventional, conventional interpretation. Such abilities are needed in many areas of life, as, a broad, underst as broad understanding of reality requires a so sophisticated sense of nuances. According to Eisner, as we learn in and through the arts, we become more qualitatively intelligent. 
qualitative intelligence and the ability to sense nuances enable us to reach the depths of consciousness, our affects, emotions and meanings. The ability to experience deeply to be touched and affected is the counterforce to numbness, indifference and toughness. This is, the, this is why aesthetic experiences, artistic activities and creative expressions are vital for meaningful and ethical life. Creativity in this sense is not about succeeding in modern globalized economies based on knowledge and in innovation. It is about qualitative intelligence, the ability to understand nuances and sensitivity as elements for living a meaningful and ethical life. It is difficult to gain empirical evidence on how creativity develops, how aesthetic pre-reflective experiences and bodily sensations are connected to creativity and in how art works. In fact, seeking su such evidence is problematic in and of itself. The core of the problem, in my view, is that empirical evidence requires a cause and effect relationship, often at least, Causal relationships are extremely difficult to find in the areas of learning, development, creativity and consciousness. Ex experimental research, dis research designs have most often relied on measurable, quantifiable, quantifiable indicators, which has led to simplifying the phenomena and separati separating direct and indirect effects, as well as intrinsic and extrinsic values. This is problematic because human experience and development takes place at multiple levels at the same time. For example, artistic activity may simultaneously generate primary aesthetic experiences, experiences foster imagination, connect the individual to the social and physical reality around him or her, and trigger complex cognitive processes that the individual is not or cannot be aware of. Aesthetic sensory experiences and art work at multiple levels and thus direct and indirect effects intertwine with human experience. This is why it is not sensible to separate intrinsic and extrinsic values of such experiences. Instead, the quality of the the activities and the conditions in which they take place is essential for generating any positive experiences or outcomes. As Leora Pressler has put it, a meaningful interaction cannot be rushed. Deep engagement is the key to learning and development, because art, imagination and creative processes engage human beings thoroughly. They are powerful in many ways as meaningful human experiences and as avenues for creative expression and learning. The question is then, what kind of conditions allow for such in engagement? In my view, as educators and scholars interested in creati creativity, we should be more interested in the conditions where we, our colleagues, students and young learners work and study. It is the qualities of material and social conditions that give rise to all experiences. In this, the notion of smooth spaces rather than striated, striated spaces borrowed from Gilles Deleuze and Felix Guattari inspires me greatly. Smooth spaces, the kind of spaces that I, I portrayed in the first photo with the sun and the clouds, allow for free movement of ideas, images and thoughts, as well, as well as new connections. If we agree that aesthetic, pre-reflective and embodied experiences enrich the soil for seeds or budding ideas to grow, then we should pay more attention to the quality of our working, studying and learning environments and think of them as smooth spaces. Uh, rich sensory experiences are raw material for creative process. Such conditions allow us to explore new connections. In my, I'm closing now, last part, very short. 
uh, in my view, exposure to aesthetic experiences opens avenues for human growth that no other type of experience can open. Creativity is an integral element in this growth and in meaningful life. Instead of an outcome, outcome, disposition or skill to be developed, I see creativity as a given, as a starting point, much like Hans Joas in yesterday's uh, talk. As John Dido Lori puts it, creativity is inherent in all human beings. It is an essential element of being human. It is as foundational as walking, talking and thinking. This is why all human beings should have the possibility to reach sensory, aesthetic and artistic experiences. Without such experiences, it is not possible to know and feel the pow power and personal meaning of such experiences. As an art educator, I wonder how it has become acceptable that engagement with the arts and culture mainly occurs for children and youngsters whose parents or guardians value art or seem to have creative or artistic talent. This is the topic of my current research within the Arts Equal Research Initiative. Art making and aesthetic experiences have the capacity to touch us deeply on an embodied level. Arts educators and researchers are also increasingly collaborating with practitioners and scholars from other fields in an attempt to better, better understand how these foundational, often transformative experiences are formed within the fascin fascinatingly complex embodied system, the human being. Through such collaboration or collaborative circles, that bring together expertise from diverse areas, as here today, we may reach a more comprehensive understanding of creativity as well. To close, I present this image. Oh, that was Arts Equal. <laughs> this image uh, where I have attempted to portray the complexity of the human being as an embodied, relational and connected system, situated with the changing conditions. The conditions can be thought of as weather conditions or natural conditions, where human meaning making is entangled with the social and material surroundings, including non-human elements. I see many similarities in this with the previous presenters, the island, uh, yes, the, the city, New York, Manhattan, with museums and cafes. <laughs> um, networks, group energies, conflicts, and so on. With this, I bring my presentation to close, and thank you for your attention.